to the building code related to electrical and bathrooms. Who's got that one, staff? Right there. Uh, he's on? Well, come on back. <laughs> some, some <laughs> I will wait, speak very loud so everybody has their attention. <laughs> Okay, uh, in in ten thirteen fifteen, 15 uh, we passed uh, an amendment to our it. local ward. Name, position. Gilbert Durant, building official, City of Shirts. In ten thirteen and 15 we passed an amendment to our electrical ordinance, which stated that uh, in an, a bathroom area, no receptacle, no outlet, no switch, shall be located closer than five feet to a shower or bathtub. And this was on originally a six month trial period. And we found that there were some issues going on with the contractors being able to comply with the requirements. And what we're now proposing after talking with uh, the Greater San Antonio Builders Association and with a bunch of the contractors is that we change the uh, wording of the, of the ordinance to read uh, dwelling unit receptacle outlets and bathrooms, uh, no light fan switch receptacle shall be closer than three feet from a shower or bathtub from the inside edge of the fixture with the one exception being where a combination ground fault GFCI arc fault device be installed. And uh, that's what we're proposing right now. I think it will provide the same level of protection that we were originally intending to achieve uh, with this new device, which as soon as uh, the, the current supply is out, a new device will be coming on the market, which is self-testing which will not allow it to be reset in the event of a failure. So this will provide an equal degree of protection to the citizens uh, within the city in these, in these locations. No, I, have, I just wanna know if we had anything else from staff. No, I, I just wanna to, to point out that uh, this was an amendment um, and it, it exceeded what the minimum requirements were for the building code at the time. Um, what we found was the builders were having these Jack and Jill bathrooms that are just so small that you couldn't even get the light switch five feet away. And so that's where it started becoming an issue. It's like, okay, we've got these Jack and Jill bathrooms. Where do we put the light switch? Outside the door, which is very unsafe. Also, if your sister turns the light out on you when you're in the middle of a shower. So <laughs> it was one of those kind of situations. So we talked through it. We worked through it with the Gasaba, actually sending um, information back and forth with many of the builders and the Gasaba team. And I think this is what we kind of all agreed upon. I think what we're here tonight for is just to kind of get a little input from you guys. This is really a technical requirement, so it's something that you wouldn't need to provide a recommendation on, but just kind of get input on what we we presented here for you tonight. So, Gil, if I read this and and, and maybe turn it around a little bit. Um, so as long as my outlet switch or lamp is protected by a G GCFI or an all, it's a combination. Yes. Then there is no minimum distance. That's correct. The, the three feet only applies to those devices that are unprotected. Right. That will comply with the HUD and the VA loan requirements on most new homes. So the three feet is for an unprotected circuit. Yes, sir. So how, how about if I just have a GFI? The then the three foot would still apply, and that would, would normally feet. be for a round fault circuit interrupter on a receptacle outlet. I think maybe the confusion is, let's use my bathroom. I'm standing at, at, at the sink in my bathroom, and two feet away up here in this wall uh, is a two outlet um, AC that's protected or ha is part of a uh, GFCI circuit. Sure. Now my house is old enough that we don't have arc fault interrupters in the house. All I have is the, the, the GFCI. So mm -hmm. in that case, is, is, is that one now um, 
would not be in compliance or would it be in compliance? It would be in compliance. Because it has the, it's the G GFCI protection. Right, what we're, this is primarily aimed for is for light switches or other devices, not just the GFCI circuit. In a residential occupant or occupancy, uh, the receptacle outlets, the plugs, are required to be on a dedicated GFCI circuit, and that is only allowed to service those receptacles. It's the light switches that were unprotected, and just on the arc faults, that's what we're trying to get to the protection on. So the light switches for my bathroom are on the other side of the wall as you as you come in, but right above me, probably, you know, I don't know, probably three feet if that high is is a row of light fixtures. That's one, that's a circuit that would be protected by the arc fault GFCI. Gotcha. Does, does the arc fault does that go in the receptacle or does it go someplace else? It's on a, a it's on a breaker that'll be in the garage or outside the oh, house. It's on the breaker at. itself. Correct. One for me. Yes, sir. On some of the older homes that we have uh, built here, we'll call it in the 70s, maybe even 80s, um, 90s, there are, uh, there's an extra bathroom, mm -hmm. and it's a small bathroom, powder room, whatever you'd like to call it. Uh, that switch is not very far from either the basin or the john, the wash bowl or the john. If Today, that switch is probably not protected in any shape, fashion, or form. It's not. If something were to be redone to that particular powder room, then we would need to protect that switch. No. This would only be applicable to those, those bathrooms where they actually have a shower or a tub located within. A powder room would not be affected by this ordinance. I don't have any more questions. I'll finish. <laughs> All right, commissioners, anything else? No questions. No questions? Pretty I'm straightforward. Yeah, thank thank you. you. Looks Appreciate good. It. Sounds good. Good seeing you all again. All right, item number three is hearing of residents. Uh, I only have one person that has signed up, and they signed up for item 6A in the workshop. So, Mr. Womack, if you want to wait till we get there, we'll be glad to hear from you at that point in time. All right, we'll move on now to item four, the consent agenda, and take our item 4A, minutes of the February 8th, 2017 regular meeting. All right, commissioners, you have a copy in your files. Any questions, comments, concerns, corrections, changes? All right. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion and we approve the consent agenda. Second. It's been moved by Mr. Broad and seconded by Mr. Dolly to uh, approve the minutes consent agenda, which is the minutes of February the 8th. Well, no other Discussion, we'll call for a vote. Aye. 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 All right, that one carries, we're done. All right, we'll move to item five, which is our public hearings. And 5A, PC 2016-065. Hold a public hearing, consider and act upon a request to appro for approval of a vacate plat of the Caltech subdivision lot 2R, an approximate 17 acre tract of land generally located west of FM 3009, approximately 470 feet south of Bell North Drive, City of Shirts, Comel County, Texas. Good evening, commissioners. 
The applicant is proposing to vacate lot two of the Caltech subdivision in order to replat the vacated land and the adjacent door lane lot three into one lot. The property was originally platted into one 24-acre lot in 1999, and then the lot was vacated and replatted into the two lots that we have today, lot 1R and lot 2R. Lot 2R can be seen here by the, the green line, and then just so you know, lot 1R is this building here. The site is currently undeveloped and is zoned general business 2 along the 3009 frontage and manufacturing light for the remainder of the property. In order to join this property with the adjacent door lane lot three, the property must first be vacated from the Caltech subdivision. This is due to the local government code indicating that a replat cannot be done to combine land from two separate subdivisions. The proposed vacate does not impact lot 1R of the Caltech subdivision. Like I stated, this lot will remain as is. It just affects lot 2R. The applicant has submitted a tree affidavit which indicates that no damage or destruction to any protected or heritage trees will occur with this vacate plat. And at this time, the proposed vacate plat is consistent with all applicable requirements and staff is recommending approval. And there is a applicant available if you have any questions for them as well. All right, thank you. The applicant wish to make any comments at this time? All right, being this is a public hearing, we will open the public hearing at 6.11. We have anybody that wishes to discuss this? <laughs> All right, if there's nobody in the audience who wishes to discuss this one, we'll close the public hearing, 612, and move into discussion with City staff by the commissioners. Commissioners, questions, comments, concerns? It's straight vacate. We're just vacating the entire plat of this property. So as of the minute something is done with this one, this property is no longer designated. Mr. Uh, Emily, Evans. Um, a learning question, if you don't mind. Uh, on the photograph, you have the, the subject property in green and then you have the the normal I assume that's the 200 foot yes, sir. Um, so were, were there any notices sent out about this issue or not no, required or not required okay. and mr. Evans just to clarify it's not the whole subdivision it's just lot 2 R. so okay lot that's one R will remain I'm sorry yes, sir. that's okay yep just the lot yes sir. it became no man's land it was about to all right, any other discussion? All right, if not, then Chair will entertain a motion. No, we already did. Already did. Sorry. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion that we approve PC 2016-065 of the vacation of the plat. I second. It's been moved by Mr. Daly and seconded by Mr. Glombeck to approve item 5A, PC 2016065, which is the vacate of lot 2R. Other discussion? All right, if not, Chair will call for a motion. I mean, just vote. Aye. 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 All right. Approved. Carried. All right, we move now to item 5B, PC 2016-066. Hold a public hearing. Consider and act upon a request for approval of a replat of Door Lane Subdivision Lot 3, Block 1, and the previous Caltech Subdivision Lot 2R, Property consists of approximately 42 acres of land generally located 4,000 feet northeast of the intersection of Door Lane and Lookout Road. City of Shirts, Comel County, Texas. Staff. <clears throat> the applicant is proposing to replat lot three of the Door Lane subdivision and the vacated adjacent property that was just approved. 
um, previously known as Lot 2R of the Caltech subdivision, into a total of one buildable commercial lot, approximately 42 acres um, total. So just so you know, this is that property that you just vacated, and then this is the existing Lot 3 of Door. In order to expand the current business, a vacate and replat was needed to acquire more land. The vacate was necessary due to the adjacent undeveloped property being in a different subdivision. With the vacate approved, a replot can now be processed in order to add the additional land needed. All of the existing lot three is currently zoned manufacturing light, and as previously stated, the property that was just vacated is partially general business two and manufacturing light. The subject property is designed to have access off of door lane. The subject property was not given access onto FM 3009 per text dot. The applicant has submitted a tree affidavit, which indicates that no damage or destruction to any protected or heritage trees will occur with this replot. The site is currently serviced by an 8-inch City of Shirts water line and a 12-inch sewer line. The site is also serviced by CCMA, CPS, AT&T, Time Warner Cable, and Centerpoint Energy. A stormwater management plan for the replot has been reviewed by the city engineer, and she has approved it. Sidewalks along FM 3009 are required and will be installed with the development of the newly created lot. No right-of-way dedications or roadway improvements are required since Door Lane is at its ultimate right now. And the plat is consistent with all applicable zoning requirements and regulations, and staff is recommending approval of the replat. And there is a representative here if you have any questions. All right, we'll ask that representative if they wish to make any statements at this time. All right, if not, then we'll move into the public hearing. Open a public hearing at 6 uh, 17. <laughs> All right, being there are no comments from the questions from the audience, we'll close the public hearing at 6 18. All right, we'll open it to staff. Commissioners, questions, comments, concerns? Uh, Emily, can you uh, show us uh, roughly where the demarcation line is between the M1 and the GB zoning on the property? I know, right here. It was done in the kind of the strip zoning, so it's so many feet from 3009. So the, the GB2 then is not, not going to serve any practical purpose. It's not wide enough. Is FedEx expanding or Caltex is expanding? So this is actually the Caltex lot. Um, FedEx is the property owner for the lot three. So they're, they're expanding. And we do have a current site plan application for the site as well. Well, I think it's really amazing that, you know, this is a brand new facility. They've only been open a few months and, and here they want to expand already. So. Um, that's great news. I, I do have one question, though. Um, given that the property uh, now abuts 3009, is there is TxDOT amenable? To, and, and that's not directly off 3009. That's off one of those uh, access roads that they put in up there. Um, TxDOT has indicated in their notes that no access points will be given onto TxDOT right-of-way. It's interesting since if we hadn't vacated, if they wanted to build something on the vacated plat, how would they have gained access to the property? I just wonder why TxDOT is being, and maybe it's a non issue. I mean, you gentlemen are sitting there, but it just seems like if we could take some of that truck traffic off of Door Lane and put it out on the, the, the main thoroughfare out there, would, would, would certainly do some, do some good for our roads. Too close to that uh, cut over. If you look on your aerial, well, I mean that may be, but uh, you know how are, how are they going to gain access to the old property? It, it, it'd way. probably be a shared access with Caltex. Okay. All right. Any other questions, comments? All right, if there are no other concerns with this one, then we will call for a motion. 
Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we approve item PC 2016-066, the Door Lane Subdivision Lot 4 replat. Second. I has been moved by Mr. Dolly and seconded by Mr. Brood to approve PC 2016-066, the Caltex uh, door lane replot. Lot three, lot four. <coughs> well, I'm reading from in here, guys. I'm sorry. All right. But moved by Mr. Dolly and seconded by Mr. Broad to approve PC 2016-066, the Door Lane Subdivision Lot 4 replat. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Huh. Good luck with your expansion, guys. We don't have that in here. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> No, sir. You're you and I'm riding that bicycle with you. All right. We'll move to item number six items for individual consideration. Item 6A is PC 2016 068. Consider and act upon a request for approval of a preliminary plat of the Church Retail Center an approximately seven acre track of land generally located directly northwest of the intersection of FM 1103 and Old Wiederstein Road, City of Church, Guadalupe County, Texas. Staff. The applicant is proposing to preliminary plot approximately seven acres of land into three commercial lots. Subject property is generally located um, northwest corner of FM 1103 and Old Wiederstein. You can see it by the green line here. The property was rezoned on October 25th, 2016 to Neighborhood Services. The majority of the property is undeveloped with one single family home that is to be demolished. <coughs> Excuse me. The preliminary, preliminary plot will be establishing three lots as stated. Lot one, which is here, is 2.249 acres. Lot two is 0.929 acres. And then lot three is this section here. That's 3.582 acres. The subject property is designed to have access off of FM 1103 and Old Wiederstein. The FM 1103 is here and Old Wiederstein is here. And all the lots are interconnected by a designated 30 foot access easement, which kind of follows this path. The applicant has submitted a tree affidavit which indicates that the site does contain protected and heritage trees. However, they will in no way be damaged or destroyed with this preliminary plot. The site will be serviced by Shirts Water, CCMA, GVC, AT&T, Time Warner Cable, and Centerpoint Energy. All public improvements required for the subdivision are required to be installed prior to recording of the final plot. The site will be serviced through a 12 inch water line located along FM 1103 and proposed eight inch sewer lines that will be extended across FM 1103 to the property and then extended along the property line to the adjacent property to the north. So it'll kind of come under FM 1103 and then up. A preliminary drainage plan has been reviewed and approved by the city engineer. Sidewalks along FM 1103 and Old Wiederstein are required and will be installed with the development of the newly created lots. The subject property is located adjacent to Old Wiederstein, which is currently an 86 foot right of way, so no dedication is proposed. Additionally, the property is adjacent to FM 1103, which is currently 86 feet of right of way. However, the preliminary plot does provide a variable width right of way dedication to TxDOT, kind of in this area. I would like to note that um, the preliminary plot does leave some remain remainder parcels of the original property. 
kind of this area here and here. Those are being picked up in a replot that we have on file for sigma subdivision. Um, so the replot and if this is approved, the next stage, the final plot would run concurrently so those remainder portions are not left as remainders per se. The proposed preliminary plot is consistent and staff is making a recommendation of approval. Lot one was going to be the, the Walgreens or the CVS, right? We don't have an active site plan um, application, so unclear at this time. All right, what's the indications when you look at the corner of 1103 and um, O. Wiederstein? The plat shows us that the corner is cut back. The aerial shows us that the green lines are overlaid on a cut back on the corner. So we're leaving something out there because that is not following the right-of-way lines or the property lines. What are we doing with that cut back there? Is there a piece of property outside that angle? I believe that was part of the old Wiederstein roadway expansion, um, that that was taken as right-of-way. Is that correct? Uh -huh. They're talking about this, this portion. So if you're talking about this corner here, what you'll often notice with TxDOT intersections is it doesn't create perfect right angles. They often want either a rounded corner or a squared off corner because they take that for future right away as we need to improve and add right hand turn lanes or left hand turn lanes, so on and so forth, and are able to play with that cross section. The TxDOT dedication requirements often cause those corner tracks to curve. That's a very common thing for us to see. Well, don't go away yet, then. And that particular, that, that short section of Old Wiederstein, um, as it comes up from 1103, uh, is significantly wider. So they've already done some, some roadway improvements there. Um, which brings up another question. Are we ever going to change the name of that to something other than Old Wiederstein? <laughs> so as you know, City Council has the ability to change street names. Uh, I would say... Talk with city council if y'all would like it changed and we can go that route. But yes, at some point in time, I imagine as it connects, you know, the, it, we, old Wiederstein is proposed to connect to existing Wiederstein uh, in shirts. I'm gonna exclude the little bit off of 35. That's not Cipolo Valley Trail. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think but it I is think proposed to go all right the way now through. is that stretch that comes in from 35 is called is part of old Wiederstein. Yeah, we'll probably have a big fun name change when we get that other section of road. Yeah. But I'll take you up on your suggestion. You know, I'm, I, I have no trouble talking to the council. So. Yeah, absolutely, Commissioner Outlaw. But the, the, the bottom line, though, is that TxDOT is okay with the dedication being provided given their future plans for 1103, correct? Correct. We, we can approve new development city na uh, street names, but we, we can't change existing street names? So we have a process in, that... In planning and zoning. Correct. So our process for, uh, and Lisa, please chime in when I'm wrong here. Um, I believe our process is that it generally is requested um, by an applicant who wants the street name changed. Um, oftentimes there's input from the people who are on that street, so on and so forth. Um, and then it does go to city council for approval. I think the last one that we did was in Cross Vine where they renamed Schnebly to Hollering Vine. Um, and that was kind of a thing that Crossvine did, and I believe they worked with the community as well on that. Right, and one of the things we have to take into consideration is all the people who are addressed off of Old Wiederstein Road and how that affects them, too. And also, Old Wiederstein, actually, one section of it is Cibolo, and the other section is Shirt. So it'd be a coordination between two mm -hmm. cities and, and residents in that area. And the post office has to sign off on it, too. Absolutely. Correct, and Bear County 911, and yeah. Um, another nitpicky little thing, um, I really enjoy having the urns and, and seeing them in the package, but sometimes the color spaghetti gets, gets in the way. D do you folks add all these, or is that the program puts them on there? Or see, in, in this one in particular, um, you try to outline the, the property we're talking about in green, and it starts to get lost down here 
and then you've got the blue one in the corner and it just sometimes makes it a little hard to pick out. Sure, this is our standard map that we provide that provides both the existing parcel data, the um, future parcel data. Sometimes those lines don't line up exactly and that's because there's a difference, minute difference between what the county shape file is that was created, which is where our GIS department gets it. And that's so the blue lines are all from the county, whereas the green line is our GIS builds off of the meets and bounds provided. And so when you survey a property every time, it's just a little different. So those don't always line up exactly. But when all when the plat gets approved, the um, county will update their records in accordance. And so it'll all line up again. Uh, additionally, Again, this is a standard map that we do have. I know it's difficult on the eight and a half by 11 that we give you, and I would suggest uh, we do publish this digitally with the original PDF, which is zoomable. It's much more clear. The aerial is even better. Um, so we provide you, we try to provide you as much information as we can on those. Thank you, Bryce. If I, if I read the traffic note correctly, there's TxDOT has granted one access easement right in, right out on 1103. Is that correct? And then and Old Wiederstein, is that a city or a county road? What is that, city road? Yeah. And we've got one access easement on Wiederstein. Is it right only, left only, doesn't matter? Yeah, it should be full access. Okay. Yeah, that's, the, Old Wiederstein's a, a collector class street, so it's not a divided median. We generally don't have right in, right outs. How, how are we going to do the right in, right out? Is there going to be a median there or an island or something? We will see whenever development comes in. So it'll get built. The driveway will get built with development. And so as the site plan comes in, uh, that is something that TxDOT regulates. And so they'll have to meet whatever the TxDOT standards for a right in, right out are. It could mean putting a, a median and forcing the traffic. Uh, there's some other kind of fun things they can do with uh, driveways as well. It really is just site specific. I, I can assume that this is similar to Halley's Cove that we talked about last meeting where TxDOT's plan for 1103 uh, might include a, a hard median uh, which would prevent, you know. Yeah, I don't know. Have it, I would be honest, I've not seen any plans no, that's, for that's this just stretch of 1103. On my part. I, I think that'd probably be a safe assumption, but. Uh, and you know the 1103 they're talking about probably at least two lanes in each direction with a center turn lane. So, you know, given the choice, I'd rather come back to Old Wiederstein to the traffic light. So. <coughs> All right, commissioners, uh, anything else? And I'm assuming Mr. Womack was satisfied with the discussion. He didn't jump up and complain. <laughs> Jeff Womack, 2944 Mineral Springs. Oh, do we have now? J just for point of reference, we generally don't have preliminary plats and individual consideration items as public hearings, but it is at the discretion of the chairman. So, I'm ask this question. You asked your question. Okay, it's just some. It's just some questions in general. I'm very pleased with it. I'm excited about it. By the way, the corner the, that y'all asked about is actually a big concrete culvert there in that little weird shape there on the side with a, with a nice smooth turn that I use every day. Because um, I live right behind it in the Riata subdivision, the forgotten section of shirts. Um, I did have a question on when you said the extra plats, and it sounded like you said something about a subdivision. I was just wondering is what that was. These up here, I guess. So it's a little easier to see on this aerial. <clears throat> this section here, mm -hmm. and this, what we consider like a little finger right here, um, they were actually included in this larger parcel, right? However, the plot is not picking the finger and this rectangle up. So this is already a subdivided lot, sigma, oh, and it's these two remainder portions will be replatted into the existing sigma. Kind of like the Caltech setup. Okay. And then, and then my only concern, I guess, um, and this would go back to Mr. Outlaw's former profession, is that uh, old Wiederstein access that is on a hill um, with a with a blind spot. 
So that would be my only concern, and um, I would say that would be the concern of the, the Belmont, Riata folks that use that. Um, all in all, especially when this was initially approved for rezoning back in November, uh, I think the majority, and of course there's always going to be complainers, but the majority of people were excited to hear that maybe we were going to get a CVS right there. Um, and of course, we always like the tax dollars for our school district. So all in all, I'm, in, I'm excited for it. When can we start? <laughs> and Mr. Womack, can you state your name and address for the record? Yes. Jeff Womack, 2944 Mineral Springs, the Riata subdivision. We got it twice. All right, commissioners, any other questions, comments, concerns? If not, then we'll call for a motion. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion that we approve item PC 2016-068, preliminary plat of the Shirts Retail Center. Second. Uh, it's been moved by Mr. Dolly and seconded by Mr. Glombach to approve the preliminary plat PC 2016-068 of the Shirts Retail Center. Any other discussion? And we'll call for a vote. Aye. 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 All right. We're done. We'll move to item seven. Workshop discussion regarding zoning notification signs. Perhaps transportation should look at that blind spot issue. Mm-hmm. They won't. All right. Good evening, commissioners. Hope everyone's doing well this evening. Um, just wanted to talk a little bit. Um, Commissioner Dalla had requested at a meeting a couple couple meetings back uh, a discussion item so that y'all can talk through um, zoning notification signs on properties. Uh, wanted to go over, we staffed it a little bit of research for our surrounding properties just to kind of give some context to this. Um, we did look at uh, Pflugerville, San Marcos, New Braunfels, Georgetown, and Temple, and how they handle those. Again, those are some of our target cities that we like to look at um, as we reference things because those are cities that we've identified as having similar growth patterns, being similar size to us either now or in the future uh, to really give a good kind of backing for where we're going. Uh, so the results of that are four of the five do use um, zoning signs. And when we say zoning signs, what we're talking about is an actual sign that is placed on the property with a zoning case. Uh, some use it for board of adjustments as well. Some use it for specific use permits, but all these things when we have to notify the public about public hearings. Um, and so four of the five cities did use signs. Uh, Temple was the city that did not use signs. Um, generally how they used them, uh, most of them are put out 10 to 15 days prior to the public hearing at Planning and Zoning Commission. Again, zoning proceedings are gonna be extremely similar to ours because there's a big uh, slew of items that you have to meet for local government code. So there's not a whole lot of deviation from that. Um, it varies city by city as far as who's responsible for the sign. Um, in a couple of the cases, the city is responsible for placing the sign and removing it, but the applicant is in charge of making sure it stays there. Um, in other places, the applicant is responsible for both placing the sign and removing the sign and providing proof to the city that the sign is in place and has been in place. A lot of them have provisions about if the sign has been removed or it's not up and in place, then the public hearing gets rescheduled um, because it doesn't meet the notification requirements that they have out. Uh, so that being said, I do wanna talk a little bit about some of the pros and cons that um, we've kind of seen as a group with some of these things. Again, you know, the major pro on this is it, it generally does help provide passerbys in understanding that there is something going on. Most often, you know, one of the big complaints that we get um, from residents coming up is that our um, zoning letters don't provide enough information. Let me tell you, the sign provides even less, just as a FYI. And again, we do that because uh, as our city attorney will nod to me, there are very specific requirements about what we have to do 
and sometimes if you do too much in order to try to be helpful, you can actually hurt yourself. Um, and, and so again, we try to standardize it across the board, regardless of what the case is, to provide that information on these notifications, though we do also um, allow uh, or have contact information for whoever the staff member assigned to it is so that they can field phone calls, emails, so on and so forth. You know, most of these signs are very similar where it gives you a case number, it says there's a zoning case pending or public hearing pending, and it gives you a case number and that's about all the information that's on there. Um, some of the cons that we have identified on this, again, there is an increased cost for signs. Whether we print new signs every time or we have some kind of sign that we can erase and put a new case number up, there is a cost, uh, whether the applicant's bearing it or the city's bearing it. Uh, additionally, they're often bandit signs. So the kind of cheap plastic signs you put down. We have a provision that does not allow bandit signs with the minor exception for political signs. Again, that's out once a year. So just something to, for the commission to keep in mind. Um, there has been difficulties with some of these cities and other cities that do this with signs being stolen or knocked down or removed because uh, we all know that no one ever gets upset about rezonings. Um, but that is a, a, a constant item and so there is a lot of potential staff time or applicant time to maintain those signs and ensure that they're up every day. Um, additionally, you know, it can be very difficult to regulate and enforce and so there is added cost to that. Um, again, we've placed this item on here for the commission to discuss it amongst themselves. Um, staff is happy to chime in. We don't have a recommendation either way. We just have information. So at this point in time, that's all I've got for our presentation and I'll let, turn the discussion over to you. Just quick, quick question. What, what are our venues of notification now? So our current requirements um, and it kind of varies a little bit, so let me give you a generalized version. Um, for zoning cases, we send out mailer notice to all properties within 200 feet, and if it's a city-initiated zoning, that'll include the properties being rezoned. Um, so all properties within 200 feet, and oftentimes we go a little bit bigger than that just as a courtesy buffer, um, you know, because we don't want to clip that one person who was 200 feet and six inches, you know, we don't want to miss them on that kind of technicality. So we'll normally increase that buffer a little bit and send it out a little larger. Um, and so those mailers are required to go out before the 10th day before the meeting. So we normally send them out at least 11 days prior to the scheduled P and Z meeting. Generally, it actually comes out to be about 13 because we normally send them on a Friday and that, then we pick it up uh, two weeks later on that Wednesday. Um, and then it gets noticed in the newspaper in between planning and zoning and city council. And there's a fifth, it has to be published um, before the 15th day, so 16 days prior. Uh, that often causes us with the way city council runs with P and Z, that there's about 20 days roughly between when it's heard at planning and zoning commission and when it's heard at city council due to our notification requirements. Yes, sir. Hold up just a moment right there on that specific issue. Mm -hmm. What newspapers are we now publishing? So we are publishing in the San Antonio Express News. We previously were publishing in the Daily Commercial Recorder and the uh, Northeast Herald. Northeast. Yes, and we did the Northeast Herald as a courtesy publication. Our newspaper of record was the Daily Commercial Recorder. The Daily Commercial Recorder has since ceased publication um, and about two months ago, uh, City Council adopted the San Antonio Express News as our new official newspaper of record. And the City Secretary's got a bunch of information about how we come up with that. And a lot of it has to do with subscription base and things like that. So uh, the SUPs and, and Board of Adjustment are very similar. Um, there's just a little bit different timing on them. Currently, we're not posting to the City website. All right, I guess let me. Counselor, does that meet the requirements of Texas law? So Texas law is going to be based on, on, on the notification area being 200 feet. And when, and when Bryce mentioned that and mentioned that they go a little bit beyond that, that's one of those instances where doing more than you're required to do actually can get you in trouble. And the reason for that is because your supermajority is based on that a hard 200-foot notification area. 
And so uh, I'll be curious if we ever have a supermajority, or we think we would, but it would be triggered by those beyond the 200-foot buffer. So, you know, the, the thing that signs do, and, and I'll use myself as an example, is that I, I, don't, I live in New Braunfels. I work in downtown San Antonio. And so for me, uh, often driving through to get to my neighborhood in New Braunfels, I'll see signs. On, on parcels that I would not be within the 200 foot notification area for, but they directly impact my neighborhood because it's a commercial area that is adjacent to my neighborhood. And, that, and that's really, it's more of a, I think, I think signs on parcels are more of a, a courtesy for that broader range of people that may not get that letter, just to keep them aware of what's going on. And in the neighborhood. I guess a few comments and, you know, the reason I asked for it, obviously everybody knows, is, you know, last summer's rezoning cases. Um, and, uh, you know, for me, I, I, you know, seeing how we're trying to move forward to be more open, more transparent to the citizens, to provide more information, to push stuff out there so people know more about what's going on, that this is one of those pieces that we've kind of forgotten about and left behind. You know, with a minimum 200 foot notification or maximum 200 foot notification rule you know nobody else is going to know about it until those fee people start you know talking to their neighbors you know uh, yeah we do have the express news now as our, our you know newspaper of record but even there you know we all know newspapers are dying and circulation is down and you know how many people bother reading the uh, the official notices in the back of the classified section uh, you know, most people are going to read the front page section, the sports section, and maybe the comics, and they're probably done with it at that point. Um, and so, uh, you know, having seen, you know, worked in and out of San Antonio for, for a number of years, you know, I've seen those signs go up and go down on a pretty regular basis for rezoning. And uh, in, in discussions over the summer that I thought, you know, why don't we do that? Uh, that this is, it, it's fairly simple. It's uh, uh, not terribly expensive, you know, those bandit signs. Uh, you know, when I had my signs printed up, they were about five bucks a piece. Uh, you have a graphic setup charge, so you know, you're looking at 50 bucks or so. Um, you know, to rezone a 15 acre property, it's about a $2,000 fee. Another 50 bucks is not going to make or break that project. And, you know, regarding the, the cons that you mentioned, uh, certainly I, I can acknowledge zoning signs would disappear. Uh, you know, if is we're providing this as a courtesy. I don't know that we would have to make it a requirement that it has to be maintained, uh, you know, for the whole 15 days. Uh, you know, maybe we shorten that to where there's only a few days that it's required to be there. So if it does disappear, that they still can continue forward and we don't have to suspend the hearing process. Uh, but anyway, uh, and for me, I would kind of like to see us require signs for um, rezonings uh, for special use permits and for Board of Adjustments hearings. And uh, with that, I'll let uh, the rest of the commissioners speak. Um, Bryce, how much um, how much flexibility does this, uh, you know, if we were to do this, um, how much flexibility does the city have to define how large the signs are? Um, Indefinite. Okay. I mean, we have, this is something we have complete flexibility. Well, let me rephrase all of this. So this will, if the commission instructs us to look into this, it'll most likely be a unified development change and we can get it on the list. As y'all know, there's a list. <laughs> and we've got a couple things that will be moving forward soon here in the next couple weeks that y'all will be seeing for UDC amendments. But in regards to signs, it can be as big or as small or whatever we want you know, ultimately city council gets that decision and they can make that choice. But the information that we place on that sign is more restricted it, it, by, the, by law? Nope. No? So signs are not a requirement. The legal requirement is to provide okay. mailed notice and published notice. The signs is an extra thing. I would say a, a, as practice, it's probably something if we're going to pick that up that needs to be laid out in the Unified Development Code so that it's uniform across because the last thing that we want is well, we do signs for some zoning cases, but not for others. And so our attorney will tell us, no. you're going to get yourself in trouble really quick by doing that. So. Yeah, exactly. No. And, and the signs, just a simple statement that, you know, that 
a rezoning case is going to be heard on such and such date is more than adequate information because for anybody driving by, if they see that sign and they're interested or concerned about it, uh, then, you know, at that point, you know, I would say that we as a community trying to notify people have done above and beyond what we are required to do. We've made a, a good and faithful attempt to reach out to the citizens, and if they can't go and, and go to the website and look it up at that point, then that's on them. And, and I think that's, uh, uh, you know, both our attorney and, and Mr. Dalla made that, made that comment that uh, we're required by law to notify everyone within 200 feet. Um, by posting the signs, we make the rest of the neighborhood available. Um, now, their pro or con doesn't enter into when we come back to the supermajority and stuff, but certainly then they can be heard at the public hearing. I am concerned, though, about something that, that, that you said in terms of, um, as a property owner, I get a notice of, uh, you know, I get a rezoning notice that the property behind me where then do I go for information? Is there any information available bef prior to the public hearing? So the way that it works, again, as the commission knows, we have been working on the website. Um, we are looking at a variety of things to help us technologically reach out to the public a little bit better. Um, but the way that the notice works currently is it identifies what the request is, the location, time, and date of the public hearing, um, and it provides contact information for the staff member for the general planning department as well as specific contact information for the staff member who is on charge of that and I will say the staff member thing was a recent addition and I don't remember exactly when it came on maybe it was after the rezonings that we had last summer and some of the debacle on miscommunication with the, or misunderstanding about what was going on on that um, but it is something we have been doing recently and so all the zoning cases you've been seeing recently have that uh, I know that Commissioner Dalla, I believe, also asked us to start including the commission on those mailers, um, which we're going to try to do, or at least send you a digital copy via email so you know when those go out. Um, but it does have contact information, and we do field a lot of phone calls with people saying, I got a letter in the mail, says rezone, what are you doing to my property? And our normal answer is, well, it's not actually occurring to your property, let me walk you through it. We get that information out. We're always able to provide whatever the request was or if it's a PDD or all of those things and talk those people through it. So the, 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 the savvy people, once the agenda is published, yep. uh, then this same information is available to anybody that knows where to look for it on the Absolutely. Website. As soon as we publish it and post it up um, on the board out here, we publish a digital copy with all staff reports and associated documents. Is, is there any intent? On, on the planning department's uh, part to at, at some point in time make this information once you send the notice out or put the sign up to make that information available on the on the website we would love to do that and as we get the staff to be able to do that you know that would be a great thing I don't think anyone's opposed to it I think the only thing we just need to make sure of is when we've done that many times before and I will say I've been here 10 years and there's always been a phone number and a staff contact on the letter and the idea for that letter is is I'm going to give you enough information for you to call me anybody who calls we've made the folders available they can come in and we've emailed documents to them and at times like for instance one of the last like I think the second amendment to cross line we actually the document was so large but we made it available through our laser fish but it was after that staff had reviewed it so that we could give them a good document that we've gone through made all the comments gone back and forth and made sure that what we're putting out there is accurate information so that we don't have a document that's floating around there that kind of has some misinformation we're still working with the applicant to get it right and, and actually, the the name on the letter uh, actually goes back at least to 2006 because I remember having that when I got the rezoning notification with the Sedona development back in 2005, I think it was. Actually. And for a correction, when I say staff name and number, there's always been a phone number. We have started actually adding the direct line contact so they know they call that number and that's the person who can answer all of their questions on that project. Sometimes it's my phone. Sometimes it's Chanery or Emily, it used to be Lisa's, sometimes it may still be. Yeah, and I, I, oh, I always put fun. the direct contact line to me just because I felt like if it went around to multiple people, it just irritates folks instead of getting 
contact with that specific person. So, but we have no, I, I think we're, just so y'all know, we're moving towards new software also. And so with that, there's gonna be a customer portal that allow people to act, uh, access information a little differently. And so it's not super new that we're gonna basically have it this year, but we should be making a decision on which software that'll be. But all the ones that we're looking at include a customer portal, which I think will give our customers more information and be able to provide them that, those, some of those documents much more easily than we have before because we, we're, just, we're totally manual in the planning department. We work off of a database. On the newspaper notice, is it does it go into the Express News one day only, or does it go multiple it's days? It's one day. So just for fun, who in this room has a seven-day subscription to the Express News? Yeah. What, what, what is the Express News? <laughs> That's what the I will tell you there's always a fun conversation at all the planning workshops and TML workshops, uh, especially when we get legislative updates uh, for cities that are lobbying to get the newspaper portion off the books and maybe require it to be posted to the website instead. It, it, it's, it only you can check makes, the website more than check the newspaper. It only makes sense. It's, it's extremely expensive. It'll run you bankrupt to put a notice in the, in the Express News. And nobody in this room has a subscription for seven days. It only makes sense to go to the web. I mean, we 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 got we got to make an agenda topic for the next APA meeting, I guess, to to get this done. So I suggest you write your congressman, <laughs> and that because it, it, ultimately it'll be local government code, and so it's the state legislature who has to change that. Well, the um, I wasn't done. I'm sorry. <laughs> Go right ahead. As far as far as the the, the topic goes, I don't, I don't have any problem with increasing. Uh, information availability to our citizens and increasing participation by the citizens i'm all for that but you know how this commission is with signs so some of the members of the commission are with signs so i i think it's possible that the, you know the city could come up with some creative type of sign i think that would be attractive and informative and but it's going to be an added workload for somebody in planning and zoning or development to go put the sign out, to pick the sign up. That's going to be a workload. I, I think public works can make street signs, right? Doesn't public works have a sign making capability? So that, that expense is going to be minimal. But I don't know that that's how we would do it, but yes. Well, the, I mean, the way I would look at it, you know, from an implementation standpoint is that we set a standard. Or this is what size it needs to be. This is the color and make the applicant responsible for it, you know, simply because if you know somebody's rezoning a property, typically it's for commercial development. That's a pretty significant investment for them to have to spend another 50 bucks for a sign or 100 bucks for a sign. Uh, shouldn't change the viability of, of that project and uh, provides the additional information to the community and doesn't place an additional burden on the staff. And from a legal standpoint, if we put the sign out at the designated time, and it gets blown down or it gets stolen. Did, are we getting into a legal problem? Do we have to put another sign? Does it have to be inspected I don't, I don't, every day? I mean, every, every city does it different or can do it different. It, you can make that, as, as, as Bryce said, there are cities that say you had to postpone the public hearing. The city I came from, no, we didn't do that. We didn't make anybody postpone the public hearing. It's because it's additional notice above and beyond what's required. And so unless there's some, uh, you know, the, our, our code had provisions about the sign needing to be up the whole time, not removing it, things such as that, but we didn't, it uh, does not affect the, the zoning case itself. I mean, it, it is an attempt to over notify, if you, if you would, just to increase participation. So. Thank you. I, I would support doing this, but, you know, we'd have to muddle through the UDC and the sign requirements and all that kind of stuff, but I'd, I'd be all for it to increase participation and I think it'd be a good idea. Well, we've we've discussed this some years ago. Uh, at one time, we've looked at, and those of us who've been up there have looked at the signs that Pflugerville actually puts out on the lots that are scheduled for replat. I guess we'll call it, and they have a yellow sign 
It's not quite as long, but if you take those two speakers that are at the uh, crawl space door up there and you turn them sideways and cut it off by about six inches would be the size of sign that those folks use. It's a standard sign and it's uh, bright yellow, black, and there's a line out there where the case number went and something else and there's nothing but a piece of tape that's put up there that represents whatever that piece of property case number is for that zoning issue and the phone number or whatever else it was down there. I think it was phone number, but I'm not sure. There were two things taped onto that sign, if you would. And then that sign was on a little metal frame. And there was one, if it was two roads, if you would, that junction to property, just like old Wiederstein we had tonight and 1103, there would have been one on both sides of that piece of property. And it was there for information purposes. It was not um, required for the zoning case. I'll try to mimic our lawyer down here. Uh, it was there for information to draw the public's interest in chunks of land that are being converted into something. And in our case, if you look at what we have left on the peripherals, if we ever rezone the stuff that's going up Shirts Parkway that's left, I can assure you, we won't be able to advertise enough. All the people within 200 feet to get notified won't be enough. And what we're going to see sitting in the audience is 100 and 150 people who are going to want to know all about what we're doing because we have several small parcels. One's not so small right up here that can be zoned to do something with. And that's going to bring us a lot of, I'll call it flack, right? Whether using these signs to stick out there along the side of 3009 or Shirts Parkway would help educate the public, I don't think there's an answer to that unless we try it. So we would have to try it to find out how big a headache it is, how big a problem it is, and if it did anything for us. I'd, I'd really like to get some costs associated, not a, not a full-blown study, but, 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 you know, based on we would use that for what, the BOA, for planning and zoning, and what else? You mentioned, and uh, I don't think of the third. For S SUPs. SUPs, okay. So, uh, you know, get an idea. How many of those are we talking a month? What's the, what's the man hours going to be required? Either P&Z does it, uh, you know, uh, material, materials costs. And then, you know, if it's, I'm just off the, you know, if it's 5000 a year, okay, we'll make a decision. That sounds okay or not, but. I have enough additional duties already. <laughs> All right. was on that's well, I, I tend to agree that uh, I, I think the consensus up here uh, if I may mr. chairman is that that you know we we think this might be a good idea um, but we are you know we would maybe like to see some estimated costs and and, and things like that um, I wanted to ask what would, you know, if we want to pursue this, what would, what would formally be the next step, I guess? Sure. How would we so, go about this? So if the commission wants to give us staff direction to pursue this, what we'll do is we'll add it to our list of UDC amendments because, again, as much as we'd like to just do it as a trial, it doesn't quite work like that. It's a, let's amend the UDC, go through that process, and if, it comes out that that's not what everybody wants, or as we go through that, the commission and council decide that that 
this really isn't the amendment that they want, then they can terminate it then, or then they can go back and repeal the amendment by revising the EDC again. But we're also happy because Mr. Glombach asked for some more information and clarification. We certainly can go back and do the research and come back with you, to you guys with the information that you're asking yeah. for. And, then and, and certainly I'd like to see if we can get some visuals of the signs that the other cities require, size, color type stuff. Uh, you know, I'm, and I'm sure they have, they might have some more cost data or something like that or say, gosh, we hate this or this is okay or yeah, it turned out to be a good thing, turned out to be a bad thing or yeah, just another day at the office. No, absolutely. All right. We done with our discussion? If so, then we'll move to item number eight. 8A, request by commissioners to place items on future agendas. Anybody got anything? Or we got them loaded up enough? I think we got them loaded up enough and we just added one more. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Moving on to 8B, announcements by commissioners. Any of the commissioners got anything that they wish to uh, speak to? Yeah, just a, a quick comment. I went to the uh, town hall meeting last night at uh, Corbett Junior High on the south side of Schertz. Uh, the community turnout for that was phenomenal. There was probably close to 100 people there that were not city staffers. 164. 164. Wow, it was that was amazing. Uh, you know, we haven't seen that kind of turnout for a general information type meeting that, that I can recall. So that was that was phenomenal. And kudos to everybody that was involved in putting that together. Um, and, and the dialogue was really good. Uh, a, a lot of good questions and a lot of good presentations. And I said it was, it was really that's what, what I think our, our community needs to strive to continue to do more of. Anybody else? All right. What quick question. Where, where's APA this year? I believe it's going to be in Frisco. You're asking that awful early. <laughs> He's got to schedule a, his vacation I'm off a, I'm work. I'm a busy man. All right, we'll move to 8C. Announcements by the staff. Who've got that one? Good evening, commissioners. Two site plan applications to present to you. Just a quick overview, no questions. Uh, Walmart is proposing an amended site plan application that they had recently submitted to add additional parking spaces to existing paving that's already there. Uh, <coughs> as you're driving, if you're facing the front of Walmart, um, this is to the left side right next to Four Oaks Lane, um, where my cursor is, is Four Oaks Lane, and there's an existing um, pavement area here near their drive-through pharmacy pickup, and they are proposing to add eight additional stalls for their online grocery pickup. And um, it would include just striping for the parking spaces and some potential signs to indicate that it's parking for their online grocery pickup. <coughs> The second site plan application that we received is for Samuel Clemens High School. They are proposing some renovations to the existing high school. The renovations will be broken into seven different phases that uh, the school district indicated would start this year, and um, they are estimating that it would end in year 2019, so roughly three years. And the seven phase program of renovations includes um, a new two story administrative building and classroom building that's approximately 38,000 square feet, a new stair enclosure to the, that would be tacked on to the existing main building, a new career and technology classroom building, a two story corridor connection attached to the existing main building, a new gym attached to the existing gym and a new auditorium and fine arts building. There's also um, some additional um, improvements proposed, uh, parking potentially an existing, uh, a new entrance here off Shirts Parkway. They're adding additional parking right here behind um, their track field. 
about it. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, in your packet, you will notice the very end, you have the monthly financial report for January. I think that's all that we have, Lisa. You don't have anything, do you? Yep, so that's all staff's got. All right, just a comment uh, to staff. Uh, while you were talking about that uh, Walmart adding uh, for the grocery pickup, Walmart is fixing to start an extensive renovation. That's a whole lots of money. There's going to be various parts of Walmart that are closed and moved around. So I'm sure somebody on staff has seen the renovation plans. They're extensive. All right. Anybody got anything else? All right. If not, then we'll entertain a motion. Oh, oh. Uh, at this stage of the game, we're not in any place that we can open it. Okay. So I'd have to say no, not at okay. this time. All right. Did I hear a motion? So moved. All right. Michael moved. We are now adjourned at 7-Eleven. I like it. <laughs>